Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is my old friend, Jim Kerr. Uh, those of you who have watched the show before know that LinkedIn Live, this show, we focus on the soft, what people call the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment that we feel toward one another. Um, we call it grace. And grace for me is the generosity we show, respect we give, compassion we demonstrate. And when you do it as a leader, as Jim is and advises so many leaders, uh, especially during challenging times, it requires the ability to act for others and energize everyone around us. Welcome, James Kerr. Kerr. <laughs> I'll get that name. It's a, it's a hard name. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah, uh, John, it's great to be with you today. Looking Good. forward to our conversation. I want to tell folks all about you. Um, I mentioned James because that's how often you're identified, but everybody calls you Jim. So Jim Kerr is the founder, founder of Indispensable Consulting and the author of a brand new book called Indispensable. How did that come up? Uh, <laughs> Indispensable, build and lead a company customers can't live without, which is Jim's sixth book. So he's no newcomer. Uh, Jim specializes in supporting inspired leaders achieve their vision for the future. And how, he, how does he do this? Through co-creation. That's working with his uh, clients to create stuff. And I've seen Jim work firsthand, uh, and I know an exceptional job that he does. And more importantly, his clients appreciate it. Uh, Jim's an expert in the development and implementation of strategy and change, and he marries that with culture. Um, he's an ID ideator and comes up with great ideas which are reflected in his book and his new book is no exception. Uh, Jim is also an exceptional golfer. How exceptional? <laughs> He's the only one of the few guys I know that actually talks about the weight of the shaft he uses on his uh, irons. So way above my pay grade. Anyway, Jim, welcome to uh, Grace Under Pressure. Well, it's great to be here, John. Thank you. And I, and I also want to thank you for that incredible introduction. So thank you, my friend. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, Jim, we're now in the second calendar year of our pandemic. Um, from your perspective, how well are organizations adapting or not? So. Well, you know, some organizations have done a tremendous job. You know, they've been able to pivot quickly. They are able to introduce technologies uh, that enable well, remote working, facilitate collaboration, and so on. Um, and I think some others maybe aren't uh, pivoting as well as they should, um, maybe because they weren't sure if this was really something that they were going to have to worry about way back when it really started to set in or not. And I see, you know, um, some companies still struggle with how do we work in this sort of uh, world that we find ourselves in. Great. But for, for, fortunately for me, my clients have been able to pivot. They they asked me to come in and help with things like resilience training and and things like that, which uh, I think help to keep the workforce, uh, you know, in the right mind to to get work done in, in, under the conditions that we find ourselves in. That's great. So, um, what are we? Um, what is the biggest challenge you think that companies are facing now? Is it financial? Is it people? Is it a combination of a lot of things? Or what's your gut reaction on that, Jim? Yeah, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I, I think as they look ahead now that we've got the prospect of uh, widespread um, vaccinations and so on. Uh, I think the the tone is starting to become a little more hopeful. Um, I, I think when I counsel current clients about it, I, I tell them, you know, don't look to get back to a pre-COVID world. That that's gone, uh, in, in my opinion. I, I think you've got to consider some of the shifts that have taken place in the last year, and assume that many of those are going to continue into the future. And you know, specifically, you know, things like if you were in a, a pre-COVID world and you thought juice bars was a great thing to introduce to your company culture, you know, to keep people's spirits high, I think you gotta shift that. And you're looking to, you know, virtual office space and, and, and virtual office settings as an example. Right. I think the, the, the old model, you know, again, I could go on forever on this topic, but it, you know, customer first was something that we heard a lot 
mm-hmm. um, pre-COVID. I think now we're probably talking more around sort of customer assimilated teams where we actually create an extension of our own services and capabilities into the customers who we serve. Work-life balance totally shifted. You know, we used to talk about, oh, work-life balance, we've got to make sure our people um, don't overwork and that they can, you know, live their lives uh, and get a job done. Now I think we're thinking about it more in terms of work-life integration, where we're going to have to just figure out how to get work done around the edges and live life around the edges and, uh, and all those things fit together. Right. And then strategy work, a thing that I do quite a bit with clients is shifted too. I think we're moving away from strategic planning and more towards scenario planning so that we can be a little bit quicker, a little more agile and make adjustments based on on what reality confronts us. Um, tell us, a, that's a great point. Oh, tell, give us a nutshell on what a scenario plan enables a client to do. Is it, is it a what if scenario? So. Yeah, it, it, to a certain extent it is. You know, uh, what we do when we do scenario planning with clients is we actually help them identify possible futures. And then we start to identify the key triggers that would indicate that that possible future might be taking shape. And then based on those triggers, we determine what steps we take, what actions will we take should this scenario emerge okay. in, our, in our world. You know, it's, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and I'm going to put you, I'm going to throw you a curveball and an unfair, but what the heck, I'm the host, I can do it and you're my friend. Um, <laughs> we talk so often about, um, you know, people, most everyone on this show has been able to adjust easily from working from home. You work for a manufacturers. Um, do you hear anything from the floor, from the workers, or what do your executives of manufacturing executives tell you, Jim? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, just to be clear, manufacturing is one of the industries that I work in. I, I do an awful lot of work in, in other places, too, you know, including financial and, and uh, banking and insurance and all that. But, yeah, lately I've been doing some work with manufacturers. Um, in fact, we did an Industry 4.0 uh, project, which is really a multi-year strategic plan for a major manufacturer just last year. Very proud of that work because it was combining kind of innovation and strategy and business transformation and culture all in one big uh, package. That's all you fit into one plan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to stay busy, John. Yeah. You know that. Um, but yeah, I had a tremendous team of folks. We co-created it. Really a, a good uh, piece of work. But, but nonetheless, to, to your question, I, I think what we're seeing there is certainly at the early stages, uh, manufacturers were scratching their head. You know, are we going to be able to field a workforce? Because they have to go to work. It's yeah. hard to do that stuff remotely, right? So yeah. those, those yeah. guys on the shop floor have to show up and run machines. Yeah, I haven't um, heard anybody with a lathe in their living room. So. Right. Uh, I think interestingly there's been a little bit of of uh, friction in that in that uh industry right so the smaller manufacturers i think became sort of takeover targets and the larger ones have been able to absorb some of those so they they basically were able to execute sort of a forward integration kind of thing where they go into the front end of their value chain and take some of those suppliers as part of the uh corporate umbrella so I think there's been some shifts depending on on who you are, what you do, the kind of products you make, and so on. Uh, but yeah, definitely a shift there. One, uh, uh, to get back to the original thought, though, yes, um, once it was determined that people could get back to work safely, all of those uh, uh, health safety programs were put in place. You know, wear a mask, space physically, shut down common areas. All those kinds of things were part of the game plan. And, and I, you know, I was asked to kind of weigh in on some of that as well with some of the clients that I worked with last year. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, now let's get to uh, Indispensable, which just happens to be named after your company. So um, the opening line in your book begins with a question, what does it mean to be indispensable? So, Mr. Kerr, tell us. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, you want to be just by definition, you want to be that thing that people can't live without. If you're indispensable, you're the uh, 
you're the berries in the pie, right? We can't, we, we don't have a pie without, without those berries. So, so that's kind of one thing. And what, the, the notion that I draw out in the book, in fact, I can read a paragraph or two that kind of explains a little bit of yeah, that would help. Please do. Yeah. So here's a section right from the book and, and it's early on, it's kind of right after that um, question that you, uh, that you quoted. So I'm reading again, this is to the reader. So keep in mind, only your customers can decide if your business is indispensable. Indeed, what we think of our businesses and their ability to delight is completely irrelevant. It is our customers who determine who is indispensable. We don't have a vote on it. However, there are steps that we can take to improve our chances. And this book was written to help you build an indispensable business, one that your customers can't live without. I love the idea of indispensable. It's kind of a, a glue. We think we all know it. And then, but you explicate it, what it means throughout the book to be indispensable. So um, you all, and part of the reason of, uh, not part of the reason, the way you do that is something which is near to your heart and it's called, and it gets to scenario planning, storytelling. So tell us how story planning or storytelling, excuse me, relates to vision. So. Yeah, you know, John, I, I love that question. The The reality is I don't believe you can articulate a vision without telling a story. So, so many clients, particularly ones I'm just starting to work with, will tell me, oh, I already have a vision. And what they'll tell me is they'll read a sentence that might be on the back of a business card. You know, we will be the best insurance company on the planet. Well, that's not a vision. Yeah. Okay. A vision has to inform who works there, who do they work with, how does work get done, how do they play together in the sandbox, what tools do they have at their disposal to get the work done, you know, what's it like to live and breathe and be part of that organization. So when I do strategy work, I start with vision storytelling. I, I, I help a client articulate a story that's engaging, compelling, and most importantly, their people can see themselves being successful within that story. That's critical because we've got to engage people to help us make the transformations that are necessary to remain competitive. So it's got to be a story. Yeah, I, I like how you relate to people seeing themselves in that story. And um, that's actually one of the secrets that uh, of Winston Churchill in Britain during the Second World War was as the philosopher Isaiah Berlin postulated, it was Churchill who made people feel on the on people on the home front as actually they were part of this great struggle, which of course they were, but it gave them their vision, of course, to win, but it helped, uh, there was a goal and it helped ameliorate or at least more of an acceptance of the hardships. Do you find that? Because when we talk vision, um, it's, it's so often at times it's blue sky, but when we get down to your world of strategy, um, there's some heavy lifting. So, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I think, uh, there again, it, it's about trying to help people, uh, recognize that they have a role to play in helping that business move to wherever you want to bring it as a top leader. Okay. So you've got to help people see that there's something in it for them too. To get there. It's not just about you being able to get a great bonus at the end of the year. It's about them also sharing in, uh, in, in the success. And, and I think it's just, again, really critical that people see how they fit into that bigger picture that that, that is the businesses that they work in. Right. Now, critical to fulfilling a vision, of course, is culture. And there's an old story uh, I know folks used to work in at a CEO. Here's a presentation on culture. And he turns to an aide and said, let's go get that. You know, but as you know, um, every organization, whether they know it or not, has a culture. So what's the reset all about and what's the methodology? Yeah, you know, I presented in the book. It's a six step appro approach. Um, it's something that I've done countless times with clients for many, many years. These six steps hold up whether you're a startup or a, a Fortune 100 company. Uh, it's the same 
uh, approach to transforming your culture. And why we want to transform it, John, is we want to make sure there's an alignment between the strategy and the work environment that people work in, right? So culture is all about behavior. We need people to behave in a certain way to get the work done and deliver on the promise that, that our strategies uh, hold in store for us. So the six steps really quickly, if I may. Sure. The, the, the first one is called strategic framework, and it's there that we define some principles about how to um, uh, create the culture that we aspire to create, right? So it's things like putting our people first and, and that kind of thing. Uh, the second step is what we call baseline characterization, and it's defining a, a picture of our current environment. Uh, the third step is vision storytelling. So you create a story. And typically with my clients, I build something that's, I don't know, 10 to 15 pages of content that describe that environment, as I mentioned earlier. The, the fourth step is called opportunities identification. And what that's really about is, is doing a, a compare and contrast of your current environment as defining the baseline and the vision story and identifying where those gaps may be. And then the fifth step is fill in those gaps with potential projects. So those are initiatives that need to get done in order to move the organization from where it is to where it wants to go. And then the last step is a, an administration step where you define how to maintain uh, the plan for your culture reset over time. Because sure enough, as soon as you deliver the plan, something will have changed and you're going to need to adjust it. So the last step is about ensuring that you can uh, adjust that readily to fit with where you want to go. Oh, that's great. It's in, and, and here, here's the element. I mean, it's so easy to, I'm, I'm not being uh, facetious. It's because uh, your model is a good one. And when we plot things out, we can see how it all comes together. And I'm glad you uh, uh, indicated the, the uh, flexibility within it because, you know, things change uh, quickly <laughs> as we're all living yeah. through world that changed pretty gosh darn quickly so yeah, uh, for sure yeah. i mean I, I joke john and not to cut you off there but i joke with clients about it as soon as we deliver any kind of strategic plan or transformation plan i go congratulations your plan is now obsolete <laughs> and it's the day i deliver it and i say that because something will have changed yeah and and we've just got to be able to be flexible enough and agile enough to incorporate what's been changed into our plan. That doesn't mean throw the plan away. Rather, it means let's adjust it so that it can accommodate whatever it is we're confronting. Right. And that's where the culture sits in. I mean, if one has a culture of collaboration and cooperation, then that's more readily acceptable. But if it's if it's not that way, um, then something that you talk about uh, erodes, and we call it trust. So what role does trust play in this, Jim? So. Yeah, you know, trust is, is absolutely critical. You've got to establish it. It's got to be baked into the culture. And the way you do it is you walk the talk, right? You've got, as a top leader, you've got to be a living example. You can't say, oh, I want you to operate honestly and then be accused in the headlines and the business press of doing something that's not above board. Right. So you got to walk the talk. You got to be the example. You got to keep your promises. Right. If you say you're going to do something, make sure you follow through and do it. And it's especially important to keep promises with your customers because they're going to make or break you. In fact, like I said at the beginning of our conversation today, if you don't keep your promises, then your customers are not going to decide that you're indispensable. They're going to find someone else you know to to fill that gap that you're that you've been filling so keep your promises and then the third thing i'd offer is this you got to measure it if you want to make trust an important part of your culture then emphasize things like teamwork reward what a team produces the results they make and and i don't want to say de-emphasize individual performance but you do definitely want to be measuring towards uh, team of results because that's how you build trust in an organization. You, you, you create a, a place where everyone's in it together. Yeah. And when we talk about measuring trust, um, what, how do you do that, Jim? How, how is it quantifiable? So. Yeah, I mean, some of it, uh, like I say, are, are being able to reward team results. That's probably the easiest example to use, right? 
-hmm. So there may be some people on a given team that go above and beyond any other member of the team. And they should be called out and, and recognized for their you know, uh, contribution. But you also want to reward that team result. And that's how you build high performing teams, right? You, 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 you build an environment where people are expected to work together. And, 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 and in order to work together effectively, there has to be great trust. Because if I can't trust my teammate, chances are probably pretty good. I'm not going to be able to deliver results. Right. Well, so. that gets down to something that you even put in quotation. It's called the right people. Mm -hmm. And so often, uh, tell me of what a right person or right people means. Yeah, you know, it's one of the six, six agenda <laughs> items. Oh, bless you there, John. <laughs> it's one of the six agenda items that are called out in the book. And it's there that um, the right, uh, in quotes, kind of gets used. It's the right leadership. It's the right vision. It's the right people. And in this uh, instance, the right people are people who can buy into your vision, who are willing to do whatever it takes to achieve it, who are ambitious, who operate honestly, who put the customer first. It's all the things you'd want to build an indispensable business. You want people that buy into that and are willing to work that way. And that's what makes them quote unquote right. A discussion that you and I have had, I know before, it's if you ask any executive, a senior player, you know, how many people on your team are A players? And they, I think the highest I've heard is 50, or excuse me, 50%. Right. Um, but then um, doesn't, when I hear an executive say that, I often say, have you looked in the mirror? Um, <laughs> and what I mean by that is, are you expending the effort to bring out the best in your people? So I know you deal with this, Jim. So how do you raise that issue in the purview of the right people? So. Yeah, again, I, I think it all sort of stems from the top. People model uh, behaviors, right? So it's one thing to say, something and, and and make a proclamation as a top leader we shall be about you know fill in the blank and it's another thing to actually behave that way and people are watching your feet they're not necessarily hearing every word you say but they're watching how you operate so you've got to set the example and it's the foundation stone for trust culture and anything you're trying to do people looking to the top and seeing how those leaders are operating and they're mimicking that. If you're deceitful, if you're one of those leaders that's crawled your way to the top and you're willing to cut any corner to get, you know, a little more for you, then guess what? That's the behavior you're going to see inside your business because people see that as a formula for their own success. After all, it was a formula for your success as a top leader. So, so again, be careful on, on how you act because that's what's really important here, not what you say. It's not just something like a deceitful behavior, excuse me. Um, it, it's that kind of thing where um, it's, you, it's a self-interest where if people see that yeah. you are more concerned with your own advancement versus the team, well, that's, that erodes trust right from the get-go, does it not? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and again, it, it actually contributes to more of that kind of, you know, maybe this is too aggressive a word, but that kind of cutthroat behavior where people are going to be operating more parochially, you know, motivated by their own personal agenda instead of that of the team. Right. And, I mean, if, if the boss is only out for him or herself, well, that's the way you play the game, eh? Right. So, so. Absolutely right. Yeah. Great. Um, you have a phrase which is a favorite of mine, too, and I even use it in, sometimes in describing this show, especially now in our times of crisis. What does it mean when we say keep it real in relation <laughs> to leadership? So. Yeah, you know, it's all about authenticity. Um, you know, you do you, I'll do me. Let's keep it real, you know? And, and what's fun about our conversation today is we know each other, you know, we've had many, many conversations, you know, we've gotten together for din dinner and lunch and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, 
you've got to just be you and as a leader don't try to be somebody else don't try to be something you're not mm -hmm. in fact if you're fake and that's detected by any of the people that are following you that you're leading initially it's going to be met with some disappointment because they're going to be disappointed that oh my gosh the person that i thought was this great leader really isn't who i thought he was or, or who i thought she was right. but in the long term trust erodes because people realize that if you're really kind of you know disingenuous um then they're going to hang around they'll do the minimum to survive but as soon as they have an opportunity to move on from you, whether inside a company or to another business, they're going to leave because people want to believe in the leaders that are leading them. And they want to believe that the person at the top is keeping it real, is authentic. That's great. And I think what's so critical about that, it's your best people have something uh, you don't or may not, and they have options. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right. They're in demand, they're being headhunted, right. um, or what's the word, flight risks. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely uh, right. You better be real. <laughs> so, uh, yes. and you know, it, toward that end, Joe, and seriously, um, all of us are human beings. No leader is a saint. And if a leader were a saint, I probably wouldn't trust him or her. But, um, and I think in, that part of authenticity is being real, yes, but knowing when you have to sublimate some of the um, uh, uh, less pleasant sides of yourself in the sense of when we have, if we are short tempered or things like that, um, that's a little bit, that's an act and that it's not dissembling, but it's acting for the benefit of others. Would you not agree? So. I, I would, yeah, you, you, you know, but that means you're being deliberate about trying to be decent. And, and, and decent is sort of something that I write about lately because I, I feel like we've lost that a little bit. And, yeah, you have been writing a lot about that, yes. That's yeah, right. and, and I think part of being, you know, keeping it real and being authentic is also remembering that you have a responsibility. It's almost a moral uh, requirement to be decent. And, um, and sometimes, yeah, if you're normally, you know, you fly off the handle or, or whatever, be deliberate about controlling the anger because that's not helpful. No, it's not. So, Jim, we could keep on going. We are coming to the end of our show. And um, I like to ask every guest if they have an example of grace. So do you have an, a story that you'd like to share with us? Sure. You know, John, I find grace in all those private scenes and sort of brilliant dreams that we all have, you know, whether it's a partner's trusting smile or a tiny baby's hands or million stars that fill the turning sky at night. You know, it, I, I look for that all the time. And, and that's what's helped me get through this really tumultuous time that we just are still in the midst of, frankly. So I, I think it's our job here on earth to kind of Take the time out that's needed to see and appreciate with gratitude. And I want to beat the drum on that idea with gratitude for all that we do have and, right. and, and see, see the wonder that's around us because it's still wonderful. I like that. You know, in so many discussions we've had, um, some people talk about grace, which is comes down to a transactional moment, but left them. And sometimes it's a moment of grace, which is transformative. And I, a few people, and I'm glad you touched on this. I mean, it's daily examples. It's, yeah. it's you know, and it can be as simple as uh, stop uh, the cliche, stop and smell the roses, which yes. we have time to do now. But you linked it to something which grace facilitates, which is gratitude. And yes, we do have things to be grateful for. And I'm grateful for you coming on this show. So, uh, Jim, how do people find you? Um, well, indispensable-consulting.com uh, is the best way to connect. I'm also on LinkedIn, and um, that's probably a good second place to look. Twitter, I'm at at James dash M dash Kerr. And all my books are available on Amazon. So depending on how you want to interact and connect, there's several ways. 
And Jim, we will put your uh, website in the notes for this, which will go out over YouTube and uh, again on LinkedIn. So Jim, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah. With great gratitude. Thanks.